Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is 9 a.m. South African time on Saturday, the 6th of May. Welcome to our sixth and final presentation of Cricket South Africa's Level 2 course. Uh, this morning, we shall be going through the revision questions that we have covered in the first five lectures. Abdullah will start for us and I will facilitate all of you answering the questions. This is not our session, this is your session. So please be prepared to unmute your microphones, put up your virtual hands and also answer the questions as best you can through the session. The questions I've calculated add up to about 84 marks in total. The level two exam, which I shall give um, thorough details about the logistics of after we've gone through all the revision questions is out of 100 marks. So you've got a good idea of the kind of questions that you will be getting in the exam and you will see from the textbook answers that we give you how exactly to answer. So Abdullah, I saw that you had been uh, launching your presentation. If you can reshare the questions and answers from the revision sessions, then we can get started with the lecture. Just a note to all of you that we will not be sharing this particular presentation with you. Uh, we are not allowed to share answers of previous questions with you in written format. Why? Because a lot of these questions are repeated in the level two exam that you're going to write and it would be too easy for you to simply view that presentation while you're writing your exam next week, Saturday or Monday. So with all that in mind, uh, Abdullah, if you can share the questions and answers and we can get started with today's lecture. Thank you so much, uh, Tom. Good morning, uh, everyone. So if you can think back a few weeks ago, we uh, were kicking off with the questions that we covered in uh, lecture one. The first question that was asked was, when is the ball to have made contact with the bat? There are four instances. If um, you can raise your hand, I'll take um, one question or you will take one question per attendee. So Tom, over to you. Do we, have, do we have any hand so far? When is the ball to have made contact with the bat? And if this should happen and you get uh, the field, the fielding, any member of the fielding side uh, catches the ball before it touches the ground, the striker will then be out or can give, be given out court. So Abdullah, it's a bit of a slow start to the morning. We don't have any hands up uh, until now. Colette has got her hand up. Colette, you can unmute your microphone and give us one of the ways that the ball is deemed to have made contact with the bat. Okay, um, when it hits the batter's hand holding the bat. Correct, collect. Well done. Imran has got his hand up. Imran, if you can unmute your microphone and give us your answer, please. Imran, you can unmute your microphone and give us your answer. And collect. If you can mute your microphone, please. Um, Imran doesn't so seem he, to be able to unmute his microphone. Hitesh has got his hand up. Hitesh, please unmute your microphone and give us your answer. Hi, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, sir, the, uh, the, the glove that is uh, worn by the batsman and that is uh, holding the bat, that can be an instance of uh, the ball have made a contact with the bat. Uh, that is correct, Hitesh, well done. The glove holding the bat, 
if that makes contact with the ball, that is deemed as the same as the bat making contact with the ball. Next hand up is Kunal. Kunal, please unmute your microphone and give us your answer. Yeah, when the ball hits the bat itself. When the ball hits the bat itself, that's the easiest of the four answers. Well done, Kunal. Thank you very much. We need one more to get four marks out of four. And Ruan has put his hand up. Ruan, please unmute your microphone and give us your answer. Uh, any additional material permitted shall be regarded as the ball striking or, or touching the bat. Textbook answer there, Ruan. Very well done. It uh, is obvious to me that uh, the people who are quoting the answers verbatim for the law have been going through their law books. Uh, this is exactly the reason that we have these revision questions. Well done to all four of you for giving those answers. Next question, please, Dula. Upon arriving at the field, you and your colleague notices that the groundsman or curator is still rolling the pits. So it's a, let's use an example, five day test match. Day one starts at 10 o'clock. You and your colleague gets to the field at eight o'clock on day one. And you then notice the curator is still rolling the pits. Are you going to do anything or not? We are looking for new hands at the moment. Ruan and Hitesh have got their hands up. Um, we've got a new hand in Taiwo. Taiwo, please unmute your microphone and tell us what you would do, if anything, on day one of a five day test match if the curator is still rolling the pitch when you arrive. <laughs> Good morning. Yes, Tawo, go ahead. Um, I, I would take no action since the arrival time is, the, the rolling is still permitted when we arrive, so we take no action. Um, why is the rolling still permitted? I think there's a, there's a, a, a very good answer to that. Taiwo, do you want to give that a second go or should I ask the next person with their hand up? Right. Um, the rolling who is permitted to end 30 minutes for the day. Okay, Abdullah, I think we can uh, give Taiwo the textbook answer. <laughs> So you and your colleague, you will take no no action. The game has not started yet, and before the match and up until the toss. So in our game, uh, the, our test match, day one starting at ten o'clock, toss will happen at nine thirty. So up until the toss, the curator can roll as uh, as long as he wants to. Once the game has started. Now the law kicks in and only now when it comes to rolling, there are two occasions that you are allowed to roll and that is before the start of uh, each innings, except the first innings of the game and then secondly, before the start of each subsequent day's play. But in this example, the game hasn't started yet. That's why you and your colleague will take no action. Perfect. Thanks, Dula. Next, Next question. question. Next question. So now, after the ground was handed over to the umpires by the curator, the maintenance of the playing area now becomes the responsibility of the umpires. So in terms of rolling, what is the maximum time that is allowed for rolling? That's a pretty straightforward one. So we've got quite a few hands. Um, the only new hand is Laksh. Laksh, please unmute your microphone and uh, give us your answer. Uh, 
Laksh, are you still there? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, it's uh, the rolling is permitted for a maximum of uh, uh, seven minutes before the play begins, and uh, and 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 shall be started not more than thirty minutes before the play, and not less than ten minutes before the start of play. It's tough, Laksh. Uh, we only needed to know the maximum time allowed for rolling. It's only seven for minutes. one mark, which is seven minutes. Uh, well answered. Um, yeah, try not to waste time on giving uh, long answers when you only require one mark for the question. Next question, Dula. So in terms of the timings of rolling, what is the earliest and what is the latest time for a pitch to be rolled on any day during a match? So in our example, let's say it's a five-day test match. So now we get to the day two of the of the test match. So we know that the uh, batting captain at the time is allowed to have the pitch um, rolled before the start of play on day two. So in terms of timings, what is the earliest and what is the latest time for the pitch to be rolled before the start of day two or, or day three or four or even five. Arjun, you've got your hand up from the previous question. Can you give this one a go as well? Laksh did already help you in uh, answering this question. Arjun, please unmute your microphone and go ahead. I think Arjun is having uh, problems with his microphone. Next hand up is Imran. Imran, please unmute your microphone and give us your answer. Hi, good morning. Sorry about my earlier audio issues. Uh, it's 30 minutes before the start of the innings. Uh, that's the earliest and 10 minutes. Uh, the latest is 10 minutes before the start. That's perfect, Imran. Well done. Thank you. Uh, what's important here is uh, that the question is for three marks, and I think the third mark you would get for saying before the scheduled or rescheduled start of play. Okay, that's quite important. So if it's raining in the morning and you only decide to start at 11 a.m., then uh, rolling would be permissible between 10.30 and 10.50. All right. Thanks, Dula. Next. Question, please. So when it comes to mowing of the pitch, at what time should the mowing of the pitch on any day be completed? So on day two, three, four or five of our test mats, what time should mowing of the pitch be completed? OK, we have uh, Taiwo's hand up again and Imran's hand up again. Uh, so we're going to go with Taiwo. Please unmute your microphone and tell us the answer. Um, the mowing of the pitch shall be completed not more than 30 minutes before the schedule time of the game. OK, um, what did I say for the previous answer? Scheduled or? We scheduled. That's okay. correct. That's correct. Okay. That's going to score you the second of those two marks, Taiwo, if you mentioned scheduled or rescheduled start of play. Okay. Thanks, Dula. Well done, Taiwo. Next question, please. We need, when it comes to scheduled intervals, name four examples as per the law and those are classified as scheduled intervals okay we're going to ask for one scheduled interval per candidate and the first hand that has gone up is uh, laksh laksh please unmute your microphone and give us an example of one scheduled interval um one scheduled interval would be a uh, interval for drinks Interval for drinks is correct. Thanks, Laksh. I'm going to look for a new name, uh, Yash. Please unmute your microphone and give us 
your scheduled interval? Second is interval between innings. Interval between innings or change of innings. That's correct. Yes, thank you. Next thank new you. hand up is Ndumiso. Ndumiso, please unmute your microphone and give us your scheduled interval. Any 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 other agreed interval? So any other agreed interval? That is correct. Ndumiso, thank you. We're looking for one more, in fact, yeah, please unmute your microphone. Uh, the next new hand is Siddharth. Siddharth, please unmute your microphone and give us a, another scheduled interval. Yeah, very good afternoon, sir. Uh, according to Indian Standard Time, uh, the interval, according to me, is the period between close of play on one day and the start of the next day's play. That is correct. Well done, Siddharth. That's the most difficult one that we often forget. And there is a fifth one. So I'm going to ask Kunal Shah to unmute his microphone and give us the last scheduled break for uh, an interval. Kunal, please unmute your microphone. Uh I I am unable to recollect. Sorry, <laughs> no. And, and, once I knew, one already answered. Uh, it, it's actually an obvious one that we've just forgotten. Um, the next hand up is Ashal. Ashal, please unmute your microphone and give us the fifth uh, scheduled interval. I'm going to give you guys a clue. <laughs> um, Ashal, are you still with us? Doesn't seem like you've unmuted your microphone. Uh, Sandeep has unmuted his microphone. Sandeep, you want to give us the fifth? Lunch, lunch interval. Uh, okay, so the textbook says that it is interval for meals. Meals, okay. okay. Perfect. Thank you very much, guys. Well done. That's the five. Only four marks required there, but uh, if you do know all five, put all five down so that if we are looking for more marks for you, maybe the marker can give you five marks for that question instead of four. Next question, please, Dula. Name four ways when a side innings is considered to, to be completed. So what they're asking here is when is a side innings? And sometimes, uh, um, we get this confused with when is the match concluded? So uh, example of when the match is concluded, when the winning run um, is scored, that's just an example, when the match is concluded. But what they're asking us here is, when is a side's innings to be considered as complete? Do we have any hands, Tom? We've got a lot of hands up, Abdullah. I'm looking for new hands once again. Abdul Samad, please unmute your microphone and give us an example of when an innings is considered to be complete. Yeah, very good morning from all the way from Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Uh, one of the ways is when all the wickets have fallen. All the wickets have fallen. The side is all out. Thanks, Abdul Samad. Uh, next new hand up we've got is Norbert from Uganda. Please unmute your microphone and give us an example of a side's innings being complete. Um, good morning, guys. Uh, a side's innings are complete when a wicket falls or when a batter retires and there's no other batters remaining to bat. Textbook answer there, Nobby. Well done. Thank you. Uh, next new handout is Johan B. Please unmute your microphone and give us the next example of an innings completed. The captain declares the innings closed. Captain declares the innings closed, 100% correct. Next new hand is Cody. Cody, please unmute your microphone and give us your answer. Good morning. Um, your final at my moment. Um, the uh, innings is played when um, the captain forfeits the innings. When the captain forfeits the innings, that is correct, yes, Dula. 
Abdullah, are there still uh, more? Uh, yes, Tom. There is uh, one more. Although okay. this is the, these are there's actually five ways in uh, in this yeah. question. They only wanted four, but there is a fifth one. Let's see if we can get a bonus point for this question. And the next new hand is Yash. Yash, please unmute your microphone and give us the last example of how a side can complete their innings. Yeah, the last one is that in case of an agreement, uh, either the prescribed number of overs has been bowled or the prescribed time has expired. After a slow start, it looks like our candidates are very <laughs> sharp now, Abdullah. Uh, well yeah, done. yes. Yeah, yeah, well done, everyone. That's not an easy answer to give. Uh, bonus point ticked. Well done. Next question, please, Dula. So when it comes to the toss, who needs to be there? When does the toss need to take place? Where does it need to take place? And what is handed over at the toss for six marks? OK, there's a lot to get through here, and we're going to give uh, a few people the chance to input into this answer. Can we have uh, new hands, please? Uh, there are 39 of us in the class. I think I've only heard from about 15 of you. Uh, so we're waiting for the likes of Aya, the likes of Ben, the likes of Bernard, the likes of Bimbola to uh, give us a shot. Uh, new hand, Ar Mokalake. Please unmute your microphone and tell us the timings as to which the toss must take place. Just the times, please. Okay. Uh, good morning, Thomas. Thank you. Uh, the time is not earlier than 30 minutes and not later than 15 minutes before the schedule or any rescheduled time. Well done, Mr. Mokalake. Um, so we've got the timing uh, now. Who needs to attend the toss? Uh, ben, please unmute your microphone and give us your answer. Good morning. Uh, both captains and at least one umpire must be at the toss. Correct, Ben. Both captains and at least one umpire. Where does the toss take place? I'm looking for a new hand. I don't see any new hands. So we will go with Aya. Aya is a new hand. Welcome, Aya. Please tell us where okay. the toss takes place. Uh, it takes place by the pit, I'd say. On the pit. Uh, on not the square. Spe not specifically on the pitch or the square, Aya. Um, you'll remember when we play... Um, T20 competitions where there's back-to-back -back matches. Um, when there's a morning match taking place and the toss for the second match needs to take place, the afternoon match, what usually happens? Where does that toss take place? Uh, outside the boundary line by the... Uh, okay, so, so the law says it has to take place just inside the field of play. So anywhere inside the field of play. So it can be just inside the boundary line. It can be on the square. It is traditionally on the pitch, but uh, the law says that the toss takes place anywhere on the field of play. Good to hear from you, Mr. Mioli. We'll see you next season if you're still okay. playing. <laughs> right. Um, Next hand up is Sandeep. Sandeep, please tell us uh, what is handed over at the toss. The team sheets, playing 11. The team sheets uh, is handed over at the toss. That's correct. And the, uh, and the coin. And the coin is handed over as well. <laughs> uh, that's very important. As an umpire, you always need to have a coin in case the <laughs> home captain does not have a coin to toss with. Okay, and very important uh, last point that you've put up there, uh, Abdullah. Uh, the captain winning the toss shall notify the opposing captain and the umpires immediately of his or her decision to bat. And once notified, the decision cannot be changed. Please, guys, this is an easy six marks. It 
always comes up in uh, level two exams, so make sure you know all the requirements of the TOS. Thanks, Jula. Next question, please. And if you can all uh, mute yourselves, please. Jula, I've just muted everyone, so you'll have to unmute yourself to talk us through the next question. So you are the bowlers in umpire. You must count. And you will allow a seventh delivery in the over to be bowled. And now that seventh delivery that was bowled is a no ball. Explain the procedure now to follow. Sandeep put his hand up as you were reading the question, Abdullah. No other hands up at the moment. So, uh, Sandeep. Uh, please unmute your microphone and tell us what happens when the seventh ball of an over is a no ball and you realize that that was the seventh ball of the over. So the seventh ball of the over has been a no ball. The the, um, the next ball, I mean, the over ends there as the umpire realized that it, it was a seventh ball. So even if in the playing conditions or the law says that it has to be rebold, that may not require that will not be required. The over ends there. Perfect. Thanks, Sandeep. Let's have a look at the textbook answer there, Dula. As explained by Sandeep, well done. Thank you. Next question, please, Dula. Name three circumstances when a run can be scored. Right, I'm still new, looking for new hands and we've got a new one. GB6153, please unmute your microphone and give us one example of how a run can be scored. Good morning. Yes, uh, go ahead. When a boundary is scored, when a boundary is scored, that's perfectly correct. Uh, next new hand is Liabona Nzoyi. Please unmute your microphone and give us another example of how a run can be scored. When the batsmen make good their ground. When the batsmen make good their ground, finish that sentence for me, please, Liabona. They need to. Where do they make good their ground? At the pop increases, right? At the opposite end. Op yeah. From which they started running. Okay. And then we've got Bimbola, a new hand. Please unmute your microphone and give us the last way that runs can be scored. Good morning, everyone. When a penalty runs is awarded. When penalty runs are awarded. 100%. Thanks, team. Another full marks for that question. And next question, please, Dula. Name five instances when the ball automatically becomes dead. Five instances when the ball automatically becomes dead. OK, there's quite a lot of instances where the ball automatically becomes dead, so we're going to take as many answers as we can. Let's start with Arjun, who's got his hand up first. Arjun, please unmute your microphone. Give us an instant when the ball automatically becomes dead. All of a sudden, all the hands have gone down, Abdullah. Um, have we got stage fright for dead ball? <laughs> okay, the hands are back up. Um, Arjun doesn't seem to be back. So I'm going to start at the top with Abdul Samad Ahmed. Abdul, please unmute your microphone. Give us an example of when the ball automatically becomes dead. Uh, when a batsman is dismissed. When a batsman is dismissed, the ball becomes automatically dead. That's correct. Uh, next hand up is Adil Kassam. Adil, please unmute your microphone. Give us an example.
Adil, are you still with us? Doesn't seem like it. Uh, next hand up is Cody. Cody, please unmute your microphone. Give us your answer. When, when the boundary is scored. When a boundary is scored, the ball becomes automatically dead. That's correct. Thank you. Uh, next hand up is GB6153. Please give us another example of when the ball becomes automatically dead. When the ball is a no ball? The ball does not become dead when a no ball is bowled. If you think about it, a no ball can still be hit for six GB, so okay. that is incorrect. Uh, next hand up is uh, Yash. Yash, please unmute your microphone. And give us an example of when a ball becomes automatically dead. When the ball is finally settled in the hands of the wicketkeeper or bowler? That is, I think, the first one that the law actually lists. Well done, Yash. Thank you. And let's take another two more. Uh, one from Taiwo. Please unmute your microphone and give us your answer. When the ball is trapped in the clothing of a, an umpire or a or a fielder. Or oh, what? Sorry, Taiwo. When the ball gets trapped mm -hmm. in the clothing of an umpire or a batter. Batter, correct. I thought you said fielder there. Um, well done. Good answer. Thank you. Uh, let's take uh, one more from a new hand. Uh, Musa Twala. Uh, when does the ball automatically become dead? When it is trapped between uh, the person or the and the uh, bat of the batsman. The person and the equipment of the batter, I think, is what the law says. But uh, the 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 bat and the person that should also be correct, Abdullah. Uh, yes, it yes it is correct. Okay. So the, uh, the the difference between uh, the two uh, is uh, in Musa's instance, it gets trapped between the bat and the person. And the previous example was when it lodges in the equipment of the batter or um, of the clothing of the umpire. Correct. Thanks, Tula. I think let's. Uh, go through all of those that have not been mentioned just for the purpose of completeness. When a player returns without permission onto the field and comes into contact with the ball, the ball becomes automatically dead. Although it is good umpiring practice to call and signal dead ball, because not many fielders are aware of this law. And then when there is illegal fielding, for example, a player takes off his or her cap and uses the cap to field the ball, that is also a instant where the ball becomes automatically dead. But again, good umpiring practice to call and signal dead ball. And then when the ball goes through the wicket keeper and hits the helmet that has been discarded behind the wicket keeper, again there, the ball automatically becomes dead, but you should call and signal dead ball because not everybody will see the ball hitting the helmet behind the wicket keeper. And last but not least, the ball automatically becomes dead when the match is concluded. Thanks, Dula. Next question, please. And it's still to do with dead ball. Yes, so we've now covered when the ball automatically becomes dead. So even though the law says when the, in, uh, when the in, uh, incident happens, like when the ball is the protective uh, helmet, uh, the ball automatically becomes dead, it is good umpiring technique 
to call and, and signal. Even though you don't have to, the Lord tell us it automatically becomes uh, dead, but good umpiring technique to call it just to inform um, everyone that the ball is now dead. So the next question is, name five instances when the umpire needs to call and signal dead ball. So five instances when the umpire must call and signal dead ball. There are 14 of them. We only need five. Okay, we've got eight hands up so far. Uh, usual suspects. Yash, let's start with you, please. Unmute your microphone. Give us one instant where umpire needs to call and signal dead ball. When the bowler drops the ball accidentally before delivery. Great example, Yash. When the bowler drops the ball accidentally before delivery, either umpire shall call and signal dead ball. Next hand up. Sandeep, please unmute your microphone and give us your answer. If any fielder become uh, gets injured seriously. If any player or umpire is seriously injured, call and signal dead ball. Thank you, Sandeep. Sure. Uh, next yeah. stand up is Krunal Shah. Krunal, please unmute your microphone and give us your example. Umpire oh. intervenes in a case. Umpire intervenes in a case of unfair play. When an umpire intervenes in a case of unfair play, they shall call and signal dead ball. Good answer, Krunal. Thank you. Next hand up is Taiwal. Please give us your example. When the umpire is leaving his normal position for consultation. When an umpire leaves his normal position for consultation, they shall call and signal dead ball. Very good answer, Taiwal. Next one is Siddharth. Siddharth, please unmute your microphone and give us your example. Uh, yeah, when the uh, the ball doesn't uh, leave the bowler's hand for any reason other than attempt to run out the non-strikers. Very good answer again, Siddharth. Well done. Good example. Next hand up is Norbert. Norbert, have you got another example for us where an umpire needs to call and signal dead ball? Yes. Um, when the striker is not ready to receive a delivery, and does not make an attempt to play uh, any subsequent delivery from the bowler. Yes, I think the law states that the striker needs to move away um, or something to that effect. Abdullah will give us the textbook answer, but uh, if I were marking your exam paper, I would give you that uh, mark, Nobby. Thanks, Dula. Oh, those are all the hands that have answered. So let's have a look, see at uh, the complete answers, please. And I will read out any that have not yet been mentioned. One okay, or both bells fall from the striker's wicket before the striker has had the opportunity of playing the ball. That's one that wasn't mentioned. Thanks, Dula. So this one, Nobby, it says the striker is not ready for the delivery of the ball, and if the ball is delivered, makes no attempt to play it. Okay, so it doesn't he doesn't have to move away from his position, uh, provided the umpire is satisfied that the striker had adequate reason for not being ready. When the striker is distracted by any noise or movement or in any other way while preparing to receive or receiving a delivery, this shall apply whether the source of the distraction is, is within the match or outside it. Thanks, Tula. When there is an instant of deliberate attempt to distract the striker or a deliberate distraction, deception, or obstruction of a batter. That point number eight has been mentioned. 
Point number nine, the bowler throws the ball towards the striker's end before entering his or her delivery stride. Okay. Point number 10, we've mentioned. And point number 11 is the old lost ball law. When the umpire is satisfied that the ball is in play but cannot be recovered, either umpire shall call or signal dead ball. And then um, if either umpire considers that either side has been disadvantaged by a person, animal or object within the field of play, uh, you can call or signal dead ball or if you feel that the ball was going to go over the boundary, then you should signal boundary four. Two more. The striker attempts to play the ball and no part of his or her person, whether grounded or raised, remains within the pitch. And the last one is a catch-all phrase. The either umpire shall call or signal dead ball we're required to do so under any of the laws not included above. Guys, again, 10 easy marks, five for when the ball automatically becomes dead and five for when you need to call and signal dead ball. Don't get them confused. Make sure you know them. That will be a good 10 marks for you to score in the exam. Next question, please, Dula. So as the bowler is approaching to get into his or her delivery stride, you notice one of the bales falls off at the striker's end. So bale falling off at the striker's end. What happens next? Okay, we've just covered this in the previous question. Sandeep, you've got your hand up. Please unmute your microphone and tell us what you would do. Loudly call call and signal dead ball. Uh, the ball does not count as one of the over. 100% Sandeep, well done. Because it's the striker's wicket where the bell has fallen off, we need to call and signal dead ball. Okay, if it were the non-striker's wicket, then we do not call and signal dead ball unless the striker is distracted and moves away from his or her standing position, um, then we shall let play continue. In this scenario, as soon as either umpire sees that the Bail has fallen off from the striker's wicket, they should call and signal dead ball immediately. Interestingly, if neither umpire calls or signals dead ball, then play will continue as normal. Thanks, Tula. Next question, please. There are three ways that you can be dismissed of a noble. What are those three ways? We've got three hands up. Um, it's gone to five now, Dula. All six of them, in fact, have had a chance. So I'm just going to go from the top. In fact, a new hand has just come up. Ashley Bengal, please give us an example of how a batter can be dismissed of a no ball. One example, please. Good morning, all. Um, a run out. A run out is a means of dismissal on a no ball. That's correct. Thank you, Ashley. And then we can go to the top and start with Laksh. Laksh, please give us another method of dismissal or for no ball. Obstructing the field. Obstructing the field is correct. And we have one more. Sandeep, you've got your hand up next. Please give us an example. And deep, are you still with us? Doesn't seem like it. Next hand up is Liabona. Liabona, I see you've unmuted the, the microphone. Hit the 
ball uh, twice. He hit the ball twice. That is correct. Well done, Leabona. They, those are your three answers for how a batter can be dismissed off a no ball. Well done, team. Next question, please, Dula. So there are three ways to be dismissed off a no ball. And there are four ways to be dismissed off a wide. So what are those four ways how you can, de can be dismissed off a wide? We've got six hands up, Dula. I'm going to start with a new hand, Nazim. Nazim, please unmute your microphone and give us an example of how you can be dismissed off a wide. Stumped. Yes, you can be stumped off a wide. You cannot be stumped off a noble, but you can be stumped off a wide. Thanks, Nazim. Uh, next hand up is an old hand, GB. 6153. GB, please also give us your real name uh, for interest's sake before giving. Hi, us my name answer. is uh, my name is Ashish and I'm from New Delhi, India. So OK, Ashish. My, uh, my answer is uh, hit the ball twice. Uh, you can't hit if 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 a ball is wide. Oh, sorry, it, sorry. It sorry, means sorry, that sorry. it hasn't been hit. OK, you want to try another example? Yes, yes. Uh, obstructing the field. Obstructing the field, correct, yes. Next hand is Ndumiso. Ndumiso, please unmute your microphone and give us your answer, please. Hit wicket. You can be out hit wicket off a wide, that's correct, good answer. And we will give the last answer to Colette. Colette, what is the fourth way that you can be out off a wide? When you are run out. You can be run out off a wide. Well done, Colette. Thank you very much. And just for exam purposes, the way I uh, remember this is just the first letters of these uh, answers, H-O-R-S. And for the previous um, question, it's only H-O-R, okay? So that is a little tip for you to remember the answers to how you can be out of a noble and how a better can be dismissed off a wide. Next question, please, Dula. So next question is a penalty time question. So in our game, it's a 50 over match. It started at 10. The opening bowler, Wendy, pulls a hammy and she needs to leave the field. And Wendy then leaves the field at nine minutes past ten. Wendy returns with the permission of the umpire at ten thirty one. When can Wendy bowl again? Two quick hands up. Uh, first one was Yash. Very quick calculation, Yash. Please unmute your microphone and let us know when Wendy can bowl again. Well, Wendy has to serve Pinan's time of 22 minutes and Wendy can bowl at uh, any time after 10.53. Very good answer, Yash. Great calculation in your head there. That is the calculation. Wendy left the field at 9 minutes past 10 and returned at... 31 minutes past 10. She was off the field for 20, 22 minutes. She needs to be back on the field for 22 minutes before she can bowl again. 10.31 plus 22 minutes is 10.53 when she can bowl again. Thank you. Next question, please. Next one is also a penalty time question. And with uh, with the penalty time questions, and if the and if a fielder leaves the field on more than one occasion, it's best to break it up into smaller pieces. So first, look at the first time the player leaves the field, give your answer, and then go to the second instance that the player leaves the field. So in this example, Peter pulls a groin and leaves the field at 10:20. Peter then returns with the permission of the umpires at 10.40. Then at 12 o'clock, 
he leaves the field again. And now Peter does not return um, to the field. The bowling team's innings is completed at 12.50. So work out Peter's penalty time, if any. Okay, so as Abdullah has mentioned, let's take it step by step. And he went off the field uh, on two occasions. Let's deal with the first occasion first. When can Peter bowl after he returned to the field at 10.40? Uh, Sandeep, you've got your hand up and you've unmuted your microphone. So just give yeah. us that first instance when he can bowl again. Uh, OK, and sorry about that for the previous question. I couldn't unmute my uh, mic. I don't know why. Um, so at 11 o'clock, he is permitted, uh, permissible to bowl uh, for the first half of the question. Perfect. Thanks, Sandeep. That is the first question because he was off for 20 minutes from 20 past 10 until 20 minutes before 11. And so he needs to be back on the field for 20 minutes, which is 1040 to 11 a.m. He can bowl again at 11 a.m. Second part of the question, Peter leaves the field again at 1200 hours and does not return. The bowling team's innings is completed at 1250. Um, now, we have a change of innings at 1250. Uh, when then can Peter bat? because his team is now going into bat. Um, I see Ruan's hand has come up. Uh, yes, your hand up was up first, but uh, you did answer the previous uh, question on penalty time. So we'll give Ruan the opportunity to answer this question on penalty time. Ruan, please unmute your microphone and let us know when Peter can bat, because his side is now batting after the interval. Okay, so Peter will only be allowed to bat after 50 minutes or after the fall of the fifth of five wickets. Okay, after 50 minutes from the start of his team's batting innings. Remember that the change of innings does not count for or against uh, the player. And so, quite correct, Abdullah will put it up for us. He owes us 50 minutes of playing time, so he has to wait for 50 minutes into the batting innings or his side is five wickets down. And for bonus point mark, whichever is earlier, then he can bat. OK, thanks, Ron. Thanks, everybody. A good grip of penalty times, it seems, from all of you. Name two instances when the umpire must call and signal no ball and immediately thereafter call and signal dead ball. So these two calls are made within a split second of each other. So they are, we only want two instances. There are more where something happens. You then call and signal no ball and then a split second later you call and signal dead ball. So two instances. Thanks, Dula. Uh, two instances. We've got two hands. Uh, first hand up is Laksh. Laksh, please unmute your microphone and give us your answer for this instance. Um, one would be if a ball delivered by the bowler makes contact with any part of a fielder's person before it makes contact with the striker's bat or person, uh, then the umpire shall um, signal no ball and immediately call and signal dead ball. Well done, Laksh. Very good example. And that is the first answer. If a ball delivered by the bowler makes contact with any part of the field as person before it makes contact with the striker's bet or person or passes the striker's wicket, the umpire shall call and signal no ball and immediately thereafter call and signal dead ball. 
we need a, another instance where this call is made of no ball immediately then after a call of dead ball the second hand went down um, so we need another volunteer and if i don't see a hand i'm going to pick on somebody kunal shah uh, please unmute your microphone and give us the second answer yeah so in the baller uh delivers the ball, but the ball pitches outside the area of the pitch. Uh, the umpire should call and signal a no ball and a red ball. Um, Abdullah, I don't think that you need to call and signal dead ball. I know you need to call and signal no ball, but dead ball would only be if the batter also goes off the pitch. Uh, Kunal, okay. so um, okay. so that's not quite the answer we are looking for. Uh, good attempt though, and uh, it could possibly get you a mark if you mention the batter going off the pitch to play the the shot. Um, Yash, you've got your hand up. Please unmute your microphone and give us your answer. When the ball comes to rest in front of the line of the striker's wicket. That's correct. Yes. When the ball is bowled and it does not reach the striker's pop increase, then the bowler's end umpire, or actually um, probably easier for the striker's end umpire to see and call and signal no ball and then call and signal dead ball. As the bowlers and umpire, we're not always able to judge the depth of a delivery to see whether it's reached the pop increase or not. So um, there you might need help from your colleague at the striker's end. So the official answer, if a ball delivered by the bowler comes to rest in front of the line of the striker's wicket. So Abdullah, Tell me, is that the bowl increase that they are talking about, not the pop increase? I always thought it was the pop increase. Uh, yes, Tom. In this instance, it is the bowl increase that they are referring to. Okay. When it, when it, when it comes to the ball bouncing more than twice, that is where the pop increase is the important line but in this instance it is the bowl increase perfect thanks so much for that clarification Tula. Um, so if the ball comes to a halt before it reaches the batter's bowl increase the striker's bowl increase then uh, either umpire shall call and signal no ball and immediately call and signal dead ball Thanks, Dula. Next question, please. Oh, that was the last question, wasn't it? No, there's... sorry. No, no, Tom, there's... no, there are more questions. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, yes, yes. Correct. Uh, there's, there's a few more. The last ball of the over. The striker edges the ball to the wicketkeeper. So initially, there's no appeal by the fielding side. And because there's no appeal, you then call over. And as you call over and start walking towards uh, your now strikers in position, there is now an appeal by the cover fielder. Discuss the procedure to follow for three marks. Sandeep, a very quick hand up and your microphone is unmuted. Please yeah. go ahead and tell us how you would proceed in this example. So the appeal still valid uh, or remains valid until the next ball comes live. So uh, if as an umpire, he 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 spotted that the edge and it went to the picket keeper uh, up and by on the appeal of the cover fielder, the batsman can be given out. That's correct, Sandeep. Um, quite important. I think the law tells us that the call of 
over does not invalidate an appeal. For an appeal to be valid, it must be made before the bowler begins his or her run-up for the next delivery and before time has been called. The call of over does not invalidate an appeal made prior to the start of the following over, provided that time has not been called. So in this scenario, the appeal by the cover fielder is valid. A little bit of field craft. If you as the bowler's end umpire believe that the batter had edged the ball and the catch is taken, you should give the striker out court. It is a brave but good decision. The non-striker will be on strike for the first ball of the next over because um, obviously it is the next over and the new striker is now the non-striker. Sorry, the incoming batter is now the non-striker for the start of the new over. Thanks, Dula. Next question, please. So, Tom, in any game at in any level, whether it's test, test match level or club cricket, the most appeals on any given day is for LBW. That's why it's very important that you do know your LBW law. So discuss in full all the criteria that you need to consider when there is an LBW appeal. There are six of them, Tom. Thanks, Dula. We only have one hand up at the moment. Um, and we'll wait for a few more. And we're going to try and list these criteria in the um, sequence that they occur. Um, so, Sandeep, what is the first thing that needs to happen? Uh, the ball, something about uh, the legality of the ball, uh, please. Not a no <laughs> ball. Ball being not a no ball. <laughs> yes, the ball should not be a no ball. Well, well done, Sadeep. Good quick thinking on your feet there. Uh, you, you, you steal my answer, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm giving you guys good hints here today, uh, but I hope you'll remember all of these on your own for the exam. Uh, next hand up is from Kunal. Uh, Kunal, where should the ball pitch, or if it doesn't pitch, uh, where should the uh, what should happen then? Uh, so if it is not intercepted in full, uh, the ball should be pitching in line between the wickets, and it should be on the offside of the wicket and not Great. on the leg side. Textbook answer there, Kunal. You guys are on fire this morning. Uh, if not intercepted on the full, the ball needs to pitch in line between wicket and wicket, or it can pitch outside of the off stump. Uh, now let's talk about the impact. Where should the impact be? Johan B, please unmute your microphone and tell us impact with the person. Um, the impact should be in line of the wickets. Okay. Uh, does it only have to be in line with the wickets, Johan? If no shot is attempted, it can be outside off. Brilliant, brilliant answer, Johan. Thank you so much. Abdullah, is there uh, something before the impact that uh, is written in the law that we need to speak about? Uh, yes, Tom, about the bet. Um, Taiwo, tell us about the uh, bat involvement in a leg before wicket uh, decision. The ball should have not touched the bat first. The ball should have not touched the bat first of the batter. Well done, Taiwo. And then Siddharth, can you give us the uh, final requirement to give a leg before wicket decision out, please? Yeah, uh, I think uh, you have uh, described the final point. I think I was about to discuss about the uh, impact. Uh, 
if it is outside the off system uh, then and uh, as an empire i i have to uh, see that uh, whether batsman attempted to play a shot or not if he uh, attempted uh, to play a shot and the impact is outside of then uh, he will he is uh, not out and if he says uh, if he has not attempted to play the any shot any offered any shot not offered any shot then uh, he and uh, we I think uh, that uh, the ball would hitting the stump, then he will be out as an LBW. Uh, what you said in your last sentence there, uh, Siddharth, is what I was looking for. If you th feel if, as the umpire that the ball was going on to hit the stumps, that is the most yeah. important part of the LBW law. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then only can you give the striker out leg before wicket okay again this is a very popular question in level two exam please guys make sure you know those tick list options and also how to word them correctly to be able to score your six marks for that question thanks to our next one please yeah uh, 30 more questions left tom so The off spinner delivers the ball from over the wicket to the left handed batter at the crease. And the best way to answer these type of questions is if you can just close your eyes and try to visualize uh, what is happening. So if you can visualize a right handed bowler bowling over the wicket and the batter is left handed. The striker changes his stance to that of a right-handed batter now to play the switch hit shot. So visualize what the striker is doing. He's, he was a left-handed, he's now switched it, and he's now a right-handed batter. The ball pitches outside the now off stump of the right-handed batter. So visualize where this ball is now pitching. It's now pitching outside the off stump of the now right-handed batter. The striker misses the ball and it hits him on the back pad right in front of middle stump. There's a huge appeal. What is your decision? Out or not out? And why do you say out or not out? Uh, Laksh has made a very quick decision. His hand was up first. Uh, Laksh, please up, unmute your microphone and take us through your thinking for this decision and the answer, please. Um, it's not out because um, uh, so you've got one mark so far, Lux. <laughs> uh, give us your reasoning, please. Uh, because, uh, uh, because in this case. Um, since he changes to the right, the ball is, um, um, you know, um, outside leg, so that's not a... Okay, uh, when do we determine the off stump or the leg stump of a batter, Laksh? Uh, when he actually takes the stance. No, when he's playing the shot. Um, <laughs> not quite. No. It's not to do with the batter, actually. It's to do with the bowler. When the ball becomes live. When the ball comes into play. Okay. Yeah. That is when we determine whether the, what type of batter the batter is. Is he a left-hander or is he a right-handed batter? The striker should not be given out as the ball is pitched outside the leg stump. The offside of the striker's wicket shall be determined by the striker's stance at the moment the ball comes into play for that delivery. Okay. Thank you. Next question, please, Dula. An ultimate question uh, for the revision questions, Tom. Thank you. And this is a this is a, a three prong uh, question. So during a 50 over match, the first change left arm swing bowler, who was already cautioned by your colleague 
during his first spell for running in the, in the protected area. So this, this bowler bowled from your, started off from bowling on your colleague's side and your colleague cautioned this bowler for running in the protected area. The bowler now, and they often do, switch ends and the bowler is now coming to bowl from your end. So the first question is, so the bowler is now coming to bowl from your end. The bowler walks towards you and the bowler is now handing over his cap to you. Explain your actions, if any. As the bowler is handing your cap, his cap to you, are you going to say anything to the bowler or not? And, some and, if, say, and oh, if you are, what are you going to say to the bowler? Sorry to interrupt you there. Oh, sorry, yeah. sorry, Tom. Yeah. Um, I got excited by a new hand and Thalen say, uh, please tell us what you're going to do or say, if anything, when the bowler hands you his or her cap. Please unmute your microphone. Um, good morning. Yes. Um, I will immediate, immediately inform the bowler that is still on the first caution and he should not step on the protected area as it would give him a second caution. Perfect answer, Salente. Uh, great field technique that. Uh, and just to add, uh, Tom, uh, um, also just mention it to, to the fielding captain as well. Just a mm. bit of field cut off. Mm. So now you've had, it's bowlers handed this cap to you. You've now uh, informed the bowler, bowler, uh, you're ready on a caution for running in the protected area. You spoke to the captain as well, just reminding the captain, because when this first caution happened, your colleague uh, informed the bowler and, you, and he informed the fielding captain. So you're just reminding the bowler and the fielding captain of the caution. So now the very first ball that this bowler is bowling from your in, the bowler now lands within the protected area during his follow through. Explain your actions, if any. Ashley Bengal, you've got your hand up. Uh, please take us through your sequence of events. Uh, do I have my hand? Um, yeah, I was say not away, um, but let me give it a try. I will stop him and inform him as well as the captain about he's going. It's the second time now. Okay, you're just informing them, or are you going to actually give an official warning? My, my first warning I will give him then, that is inform, informing the captain. Okay, you've got to use the word warning, hey? Uh, because informing and warning is two different things. So it's, so because he has been given a caution, we now give him a first and final warning. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Ashley. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Th yeah. Thanks, S. So now you've now given the bowler his first and final warning, and you'll inform the fielding captain as well. So, firstly, uh, there's a caution. Second now is the first and final warning for running in the protected area. And now, later in the spell, there's a huge LBW shot, but you are unsighted because the same bowler in his follow through was, uh, in his follow through, uh, uh, ran straight down the pitch into the protected area. You as the bowler in umpire, you turn down the LBW appeal because the bowler was blocking your view. So now explain your actions, if any. There are 
four marks for this answer. So quite a few things need to be done and said. Sandeep, you've got your hand up. Please tell us what you are going to do and say to the bowler and the captain. Um, because you were been blocked. So as it mentioned, turn down the LBW appeal because you cannot visualize what, what exactly had happened there. Um, secondly, because already a first and final warning was issued and this was an, another uh, another instance where he ran, uh, ran on the dangerous area, danger area. So uh, baller should be now or would be suspended. Um, the remaining part of the over should be bowled, uh, informed to uh, to the captain of the bowling side as well as your colleague. The remaining part of the over should be bowled by a bowler who has not bowled a previous previous over or is not going to bowl the next over. Um, report this uh, instance to the governing body of the fielding side. Inform the uh, opposite side captain as practicable. Uh, do we report this instance uh, in the match report? Abdullah, if you can give us the textbook answer there. Um, I think <laughs> Sandeep is very close to the textbook. Yeah, yeah, no, you see, I was uh, the textbook answer. Yeah. <laughs> so please, 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 have... please be, please be, bear, please be in have a mind. It's four fourteen a.m. in my at my place, so. Where no, are well you? Sand I, where I'm are in you US. In... I, I'm in US, so it started at three o'clock, got up at two thirty, two thirty, two fifty. <laughs> but that's, yeah, that's great. Well done, Sandeep. That is commitment. Sandeep. Yeah, that that is commitment. He, so, that is. So, commitment. so it means you can umpire in your sleep, Sandeep. That's how good you are <laughs> on your laws. Yeah, and I have I have I have a game at seven thirty, so I have to start at seven thirty also. All right. Job. Okay. All the best for your game and well done. Thank that you. was that was a comprehensive answer to that scenario. So to go through the the first portion, um, you will remind the bowler that you see so ready on a course and for running in the protected area, and you'll also mention it to the fielding captain. Then the second part was when the bowler ran in it in the protected area again, caution the bowler and inform the other umpire what has occurred. Inform the bowler that this is, is a final warning and this warning to apply throughout the innings. You shall inform the captain of the fielding side and the batters of what has occurred. Then, after the ball now becomes dead, now the third time when the bowler runs in the protected area, direct the captain of the fielding side to suspend the bowler immediately from bowling. The rest of the over two balls will have to be completed by another bowler, and this bowler should not have bowled the previous over, nor is this bowler allowed to bowl the next over. You will inform everyone, captain of the fielding side, the batters, and when practicable, captain of, of the batting side, and to report this to the governing body of cricket for that particular match. So well done, everyone. Tom, the last of our revision questions. It's 50 over match, and the striker eats the ball and starts running. Striker then makes good his ground at the bowler's end and now turns for the second. The short leg fielder then will fully obstruct the striker with his foot with his foot and the striker falls to the ground what happens next abdullah if i'm not mistaken this question is worth six marks uh um, yes tom it uh, it is worth six marks you're right so there's a fair bit uh, to get through in terms of the procedure that applies to this scenario and uh, you had your hand up from the previous question. Are you happy to answer this question as well? 
as I say that, you put your hand down, so I guess not. <laughs> um, Sandeep, we're going to give uh, somebody else a chance. Um, Abdul Samad, if you can unmute your microphone and uh, please take us through what you would do in this scenario. Well, I would uh, immediately call and signal a dead ball. Uh, yeah, you can carry on, Abdul Samad. Yes, I would call and signal a dead ball. Is that all you're going to do? No, I have other answers as well. Uh, award five penalty runs to the batting side. Correct. Neither the batter shall be dismissed from that delivery. Huh? Uh, ball shall not be counted one of the over. Correct. Uh, any runs completed before the offense shall be scored together with those five penalty runs. What about the run in progress, Abdul? Yes, the runs uh, will be counted. If it's uh, if they were completing the second run, the second run uh, and the offense took place, that the second run will be counted. So total be, uh, penalty runs will be seven. Five plus the two. Whether the um, batters have crossed or not. The, yeah, whether the they run. have crossed or not during the uh, second run attempt and they well, were intercepted by well the done. offense. Well and uh, then the batters shall, at the wicket, shall decide who will face the next delivery. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, well, <laughs> lastly, they, we, we should inform the governing body from the, and, uh, from the incident, inform the fielding captain as well of what happened. And finally, we need to report the incident to the governing body for that particular match. Yes, sir. Abdul Samad, that is an incredible end to a great revision questions session. Thank you. Uh, well done to you and well done to everybody else that has been involved in attempting to answer the questions. Uh, Abdullah, I think we've got a very good pass uh, from our candidates today if they were writing this particular exam. Um, as mentioned, the exam is out of 100 marks. Uh, this, these particular revision questions that we've gone through are very similar to what you'll expect to see in the exam. Uh, I think we had about 88 marks worth of questions so uh, this means that we've almost covered an entire level two question paper today. So if you are able to answer all of these questions by yourself without having to refer to your law book, uh, then I consider you uh, ready for the level two exam. So let us go through the procedures as to how and when the exams are going to take place. I'm going to share with you my um, two slides. And the first slide is just the uh, timetable of the course, uh, where we've been and where we are going. So today is the Saturday, the 6th of May, uh, which is our revision lecture. And then uh, what will happen after this lecture is I will send the recording of the lecture, uh, the link thereof to all of you on my mailing list. Uh, also on that email, I will send the course material again for those of you who might not have got it before the course started. Included in that course material will be today's presentation that Abdullah has taken us through. However, I am going to remove the answers of today's presentation. Why? Because a lot of these questions are repeated in the level two exam, so we can't give you physically the answers typed out. Um, the 
those of you who are going to be writing the exam remotely, um, you will be have access to your computers, so it would be too easy for you to simply go through that presentation with the answers. So we'll provide you all the questions and you will have to actually study yourself and maybe write those answers out for yourself as practice. Um, between now and the 11th of May is your chance for all of you who wish to write the exam to pay the exam fee. Uh, the exam fee differs for different candidates. Members of Western Province Cricket Umpires Association uh, do not need to pay anything. Uh, the exam is free. Uh, all you need to do is to email training at wpcua.co.za letting me know when you are going to write. There are two options for writing this exam. Uh, the first option is next week, Saturday, at the same time that we've been having our lectures, 9 a.m. South African time to 11 a.m. The exam is supposed to be two hours. We will, within reason, give you extra time if you need. Uh, and the two physical options to write are at Newlands Cricket Ground, or you will write remotely while being watched on Microsoft Teams by myself and Abdullah. So what will happen is that you will all get a link to a Microsoft Teams meeting for either Saturday 9 a.m. South African time or Monday 18, 30, 15th of May. You need to inform me when you make your payment for your exam. You need to inform me whether you're writing on Saturday the 13th of May at 9 a.m. or you're writing at Monday the 15th of May at 18.30 and whether you're writing at Newlands Cricket Ground or you will be writing remotely and via Microsoft Teams. And I will share the meeting protocols for the remote exam on the next slide. Uh, I have received quite a few of you who have made payment for the exam. Thank you very much. But you haven't told me which day you're going to be writing and which platform you're going to be using. Are you going to be coming to Newlands Cricket Ground or are you going to be on Microsoft Teams? Obviously, those of you who are not in Cape Town will be uh, writing remotely via Microsoft Teams. However, um, I'm not sure where everybody is located. So please just confirm with me uh, which day and which format you're going to be writing. Um, so moving on to the, before I move on to the um, protocols, um, I'll go through the exam fees again, free for Western Province Cricket Umpires Association members, members of other umpires associations in South Africa. Uh, if you wish to write with us on these dates and these platforms, then you need to pay a hundred rands. If however, you have an arrangement with your association to write uh, in your cricket ground at a different time. That is fine. We don't have anything to do with it. So then you wouldn't have to pay us. But if you are writing remotely with us either on Saturday the 13th of May or Monday the 15th of May, you need to pay Western Province Cricket Umpires Association 100 rands. Candidates in South Africa who are not members of any umpires association, 300 South African rands, and candidates outside of South Africa, 30 US dollars or 500 rands. Remember that if you have subscribed to our YouTube channel, uh, then you uh, are allowed to discount your exam fees to down from 30 US dollars to 27 US dollars or from 500 South African rands to 450 rands. Or if you are in South Africa, you can discount from 300 rands down to 250 rands. 
Um, unfortunately, because this 100 Rand fee is already quite low, uh, there's no discount offered on for members of other umpires associations in South Africa. But please do subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, Abdullah, maybe if you can just uh, copy and paste the link to our YouTube channel into the chat box so anyone who doesn't know it uh, can also go to our YouTube page and subscribe to it. So what is going to happen next week, Saturday at 9 a.m. or the following Monday at 18.30 South African time during the remote writing of the exam. Um, so all of you who have told me when you're going to write your exam and if you're going to write remotely, I will email you an answer sheet for the exam, okay? It's written on a specific uh, paper that has got Cricket South Africa branding on it. And the first page is where you will fill in all your details. Um, you'll remember that for level one, you needed to f to say that you are uh, your association is Western Province. You don't need to do that this time around. When you fill in your address, you fill in exactly where you live, which state and which country you live in. Uh, so put in your full address and um, Print out those answer sheets uh, sometime this coming week because I will be sending the answer sheets to all of you, in fact, uh, later today. Uh, so you have them to print out any time during the week. So you won't be writing on normal uh, paper without the Cricket South Africa branding. You will be writing on um, answer sheets provided by Cricket South Africa. So print out your own and there are 24 questions. You don't have to start each question on a new page, uh, but I would say about 15 pages should be enough for you to uh, write and complete your level two exam. If you're one of those persons who's got a big handwriting, then maybe print out 20 pages just to be sure. Um, you are not allowed to type your answers. You have to handwrite your answers. And uh, this is because, again, it would be too easy to copy and paste an electronic uh, copy of the laws into your answers if the answers were provided electronically on email. Um, so what will happen is you will get a meeting request for Saturday, the 13th of May at 9 a.m. And once all of us are in that meeting, then I will copy and paste question by question from the first question to the 24th question into the chat box um, each question. So you're not going to be emailed the question paper. Uh, you will read the questions off the screen. So uh, that is why we um, prescribe that you actually use a computer rather than a phone, uh, because it would be more difficult to read the questions on a small screen. Uh, but if you don't have a computer, then uh, a phone is your only option, so be it. Uh, but please make sure that at all times your camera is on and your microphone are also on. This is a way for us to make sure that you are alone in the room and you're not getting any assistance uh, via somebody or looking around uh, to your law book. This is a closed book exam and uh, you should be in a room on your own that is quiet for you to uh, write your exam in. Uh, very importantly, write number of pages at the bottom of each page. There is a space provided so that when you have completed your writing your exam, uh, what you do is you take uh, pictures with your phone or if you are in your office, you can just scan the document. We need it in one PDF 
uh, not 20 different pictures sent via WhatsApp. We do not accept submissions via WhatsApp. The submissions will be via email in one PDF. So uh, smartphones nowadays allow you to take, uh, to scan emails, I mean, scan documents using your phone. Uh, Apple has got a notes, um, so your iPhone has got a notes application. Use the notes application to scan the documents, uh, 20 pages, and then consolidate it into one PDF. For Android users, there's an app called Cam Scanner, which also consolidates your photos into one PDF. Uh, please make sure that your photos are clear and that the document is legible before emailing it. Think that some person, a uh, Cricket South Africa top six umpire is going to be marking these exams. Think that that person is going to print out your answer sheet and needs to be able to read your answers. So write clearly and also make sure that when you take a photo of your pages, they come out clear and visible for the marker to be able to mark. Um, so you will do all of this still within view of the camera so that we make sure that there's no cheating involved. Um, and then once you're done taking the pictures and consolidating them into one PDF, you will email your answer sheet to uh, Abdullah and I on our Gmail accounts. We will be able to check them immediately while you're still on the Teams call. And once you've sent the email, please type in the chat box answer sheet sent. We will go then look for it on our emails, go through the pages that you've sent us in one PDF and please stay in the meeting until one of us types in the chat box that we are happy with your answer sheet and then you can exit the meeting. Uh, at any time during the exam, if you have any question, raise your virtual hand if you need to ask and wait for either Abdullah and I to say yes, go ahead and ask your question. Um, a good idea is leaving your microphone on so we can hear your surroundings, but switching the volume down so that you are not disturbed by other candidates asking Abdullah or I questions. Okay, so microphone on, but volume down. Uh, and only when you ask a question, then you can put your volume up so that you can hear the answer that we give. Uh, there will be instructions given just before uh, the exam starts. And the reason I say we will start posting the questions in the chat box at three minutes past nine is to give everybody an opportunity to be in the chat room before posting the questions. Because if you arrive at uh, five minutes past nine, you will not see the questions that are posted uh, before you arrived in the meeting. So please, everybody be on time. Uh, make sure that when you send your proof of payment sometime in the next week, the deadline is Thursday, the 11th of May. Uh, make sure that you let us know which day you're writing, Saturday or Monday, and if you're writing at Newlands Cricket Ground or if you'll be writing remotely um, via Microsoft Teams. I have given all the information I think I need to give. Uh, one more thing that I will say is that some of you haven't been to Newlands Cricket Ground and will be coming to write at Newlands Cricket Ground. Uh, we're just waiting to confirm the exact location. We hope it will be the media center and I will uh, on email uh, once it's confirmed later in the week where exactly uh, I will give directions to get into Newlands Cricket Ground, parking at Newlands Cricket Ground, 
and how to get to the meeting room that we will be using for the exam. Uh, the rest of you will be writing remotely. It's a Microsoft Teams meeting as you have been attending through the six lectures and you just need to make sure that you are able to view the chat box. I'm going to stop sharing now and I'm going to go to the chat box to see if there are any uh, questions that I haven't answered in my explanation of the logistics. Um, so I am just scrolling through. I see a lot of you were answering uh, questions in the chat box and I'm not going to go through those. There's a law question, I think, here from Ndumiso Abdullah. If the fielding team appeal after the call of over, should the umpire go back to their original position and then give the batter out, or can they give the batter out standing at square leg? That would look very interesting. Ndumiso, there's nothing in the law that, that uh, tells us you have to go back to your original position. I have seen both. Some umpires do go back to the original position and give the striker out. I've also seen uh, umpires stand where they are and then give the the, the uh, striker out. So there is uh, no right or wrong uh, here. Um, I think most umpires, if there's an appeal, they would um, they would where they're standing, they would then give the umpire out. But some would say, some would maybe be technical and go to behind the, the bowlers, uh, the stumps at the bowlers in and give the striker out. There's no right or wrong. There's nothing in the law that covers where you need to stand. I haven't had this before, Tom. I've I've never. <laughs> I've never uh, had an appeal uh, um, after I've called over uh, and then there's an appeal. I've, or I've had appeals where where I actually thought, sure, I'm sure I heard an itch, but there was no appeal. And I've also had LBW appeals where I thought, sure, I think that's out, but Polar, Norkeep, or no one appealed. I had those before, but I haven't had um, appeal that happened in over um, after I called over. I'm not sure if you had one. No, I haven't had one, Abdullah, and I must say, I think you don't want to make a scene um, as an umpire. You don't really want to be the center of attraction, but to give a batter out caught behind while you're at square leg, I think would look ridiculous. So, um, whereas when we confer for obstructing the field, for example, we would come together and you would give the batter out from that position of consultation. Um, I wouldn't go back to behind the stumps on the bowler's end. Um, but in this instant, if I'm standing at square leg and I'm giving a batter out for court behind, I think I would, yeah, it, it, it's going to look ridiculous either way. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it's, yeah. Actually, what I'll do, Tom, is if, I'll Ign just say not out. Ignore the appeal. Ignore yeah. the appeal. Yeah, because it's it's come way too late. It's going to look ridiculous if you give it out. So, yeah, rather just say not out uh, to save yourself uh, a lot of embarrassment. <laughs> um, question from Laksh. Uh, when will we receive the results? Um, good question, Laksh. Um, so it really all depends on how many of you are going to be writing. I think up until now, I've got 20 candidates who have either paid or are members who are going to write. Uh, 20 candidates to mark would take us, uh, I'd say, a week. Um, but I'm quite sure that we will have quite a lot more um, of you paying for the exam and uh, wanting to write. If we get up to, say, 50 candidates writing, uh, that's going to take us three weeks, maybe four weeks to get your results. So I will confirm on Thursday, the 11th of May, once all the confirmations for the exam are have been made, uh, how long 
we think it will take for your results to uh, be uh, published. And just a reminder, a few of you have asked on email or WhatsApp, what happens if you do not pass? Um, so the first thing I need to tell you is that you cannot write on Saturday and then have your exam marked on Sunday. And then if you haven't passed, try writing again on Monday. Uh, that's not going to happen. We're only going to submit all the exam papers to the markers after Monday's exam. So uh, you won't get your result the day after you've written. Um, if you get, of course, the pass mark is 80% or more. So uh, if you get between 75 and 79%, then uh, I will contact you individually and um, having got your script fed back to me as to which questions you got wrong, I will pick one or two questions that you got wrong uh, that if you get right by email, you will then have enough marks to pass. So that will happen um, in the background, possibly two weeks after you've written when the marks are coming in. Uh, again, depending on how many people have written. If you got between 65 and 74 percent, then we will allow you to reattempt the exam when the level three exams take place sometime in July. So level three, we haven't finalized the dates yet because we don't know how long it's going to, to take to mark the level two exams. So. Thursday 11th of May, when we know how many people are writing the level two exam, then we will uh, be able to publish the level three uh, lecture dates as well as the exam dates. So if you get between 65% and 74% for uh, level two now in May, then you can repeat the exam for free in July. If you get less than 65%, you will have to attend the level two course again. And at this stage, I'm not sure if we'll have another level two course in this year, 2023, or if our next level two course will only be in winter of 2024. Uh, that again will be confirmed probably after the level three uh, exam and course have taken place. Okay. Um, Kaiwo asks, what scanner do Android phones need to use? Cam scanner. So just type it into your Google store. Cam scanner is the best one that I've seen uh, people submitting their answer sheets with. Uh, Cody asks, the written assignments, who are marking it? When we will be getting the results? Can we place the answers in our own words as Mr. Steenkamp has been doing so profoundly or do they only want textbook answers? Uh, so Cody, I think I've answered the first two questions as to who's marking it and when the results will come out. Uh, your third question is, can you put your answers in your own words? Uh, the answer is definitely yes. Uh, we are not testing your photographic memory skills. We are testing your understanding of the law. So as long as you give your answers in a way for the marker to see that you know the law and you know how to apply the law, uh, then you will get your desired marks. Taiwo, can we write the questions out first before answering it? Taiwo, uh, that will be wasting time. All you need to do is write question one at the top, and then you write your answer for question one below uh, where you've written question one. Uh, do not write out the questions that will be wasting your time. As mentioned, the exam is supposed to be written in two hours. It's 100 marks. And really, if you know your laws 
and you've practiced these revision questions, you should finish within two hours. Uh, however, especially for those of you writing remotely, uh, there might be some technical glitches and also interruptions with Abdullah and I talking and answering questions. So we, we, we can extend it to say two and a half hours, but really we can't be too generous, guys. Uh, try uh, as much as possible to finish the exam within two hours. Um, next question, what is the duration of the exam? I've just answered. Uh, what happens if the network breaks in between the exams? Would the student need to rejoin uh, Yomi? Uh, that's correct. Uh, please rejoin as soon as possible. You cannot be um, away from the chat room for more than five minutes because you could be doing anything untoward while we're not watching you. So uh, please make sure that you've got a good strong internet connection and that your camera works and that your microphone works. Uh, very important guys, we need to be strict when it comes to these protocols. Uh, if not, and if you're found to be not following these protocols, then we will not accept your submission of your answer sheet and it will not be marked. Uh, there has been some um, wrongdoings in the past where um, umpires have been expelled for life from umpiring in Cricket South Africa. So um, we need to take these protocols seriously. Otherwise, we won't be offering these uh, remote writing options in future. OK. Um, Laksh asks, would having gone through these questions help you pass the exam? Definitely, Laksh, as I said, we've gone through 88 marks and if you're able to answer them on your own, you will be able to pass the level two exam. Uh, are there courses for third umpires? Um, Abdullah, I think maybe you can just touch on uh, the practical uh, courses that you take the guys through here at Western Province Cricket Umpires Association and also the TV umpire uh, uh, lectures that you gave to the Varsity Cup um, umpires before September last year when they had their tournament. Uh, so, so what is Ashley referring to? Um, TV umpires, or or is it um, um, reserve umpire duties? I think you can answer for both, Abdullah. Oh. He doesn't specify. Um, so, so as um, we don't have uh, formal uh, courses, but what I do is, um, especially those umpires uh, locally. Um, that uh, goes to our Cricket South Africa age group um, tournaments. I do take them through um, reserve umpire duties or um, or fourth umpire duties, where I take them through everything that needs to be done from when you get to the ground. What is what are all expected of a uh, reserve umpire? I do have sessions where I, I take them through. I also do have TV umpire um, sessions. Uh, one of our competitions in South Africa is called Varsity Cup, and it's a televised competition. And uh, that competition, they do utilize um, the uh, club umpires. So I take, I take um, some of the club umpires through TV umpire um, processes. Um, I go through the theory as well as we do uh, simulations. But those are separate courses. We, we do not have formal um, courses um, that we only focus on TV umpiring, a TV umpire or um, reserve umpire. Did I answer the question, Tom? Yes, thanks, Dula. Um, if I can add to that, Ashley, we do have on our YouTube channel a online lecture that Abdullah presented to the umpires who were going to Varsity Cup last year, September. Um, I think Abdullah had about four lectures with those umpires. Unfortunately, the, the real uh, crux of those lectures 
was actually going through TV umpire reviews and a lot of that material has got copyright and when we tried to load the lecture onto our YouTube channel, um, the copyright infringement uh, actually blocked that those lectures from being published publicly. So, so yeah, um, what maybe we can do in future is just uh, open up those lectures to uh, the public and you can view the lecture live instead of uh, trying to watch it on YouTube where it won't be posted. Next question is from Mahesh. Uh, is color print enough or black and white when we print it out? Um, Mahesh, black and white is perfectly fine uh, when you print out the answer sheet. And uh, if your scanner scans in black and white, that's also fine. Uh, no need for, for, for color. Uh, but of course, if you want to, you are welcome to use color printing and color scanning. Siddharth wants to know at what level uh, we can umpire after getting Cricket South Africa's level two qualification. Um, so I can only answer as to Western Province Cricket Umpires Association. Uh, we umpire in the top five men's club leagues. Um, the highest is the Premier Division, and then you've got your first division A, first division B, first division C, and first division D. When you have got level one, you can umpire in first division D and first division C. When you have got level two, you can umpire in first division B. And when you've got level three, you can umpire in first division A and the premier division. I'm not sure how other associations in South Africa uh, do it, and I'm not sure how other associations around the world allow um, what level to umpire at. Um, so that's all the information I can give you, Siddharth. Uh, Laksh asks, if I practice the revision questions that we went through today, would that alone ensure that we would pass the exam? Um, I suggest so, Laksh. Sandeep says, Mr. Abdullah and Mr. Tom, could you please stay on the call for a few minutes after this call and everyone drops? I have questions related to our exam date and time. Um, Sandeep, if you are in the States, yes, unfortunately, that is 3 a.m. Uh, on the East Coast, as you mentioned, and it um, is, but it is later on the Monday, but you would probably be at work on the Monday. Got it. Um, yeah, unfortunately, are, I, I beg your pardon? No, on the same day, on the Saturday, um, even if I'm fine to get up at early in the morning and give the exam, but unfortunately, I'm returning on the same day, coming back from a tournament, so I have a flight to catch at 5 o'clock in the morning. So I'll be at the airport on that day. Um, and I, I'll be in the central time zone, which is uh, one hour behind us. So it will be 2 a.m. Uh, and I'll be at, at airport by four, you know 3 a.m. So, and then on Monday, I probably then take a work uh, half day off and then appear for the exam. That's the only option that if we don't have any alternative days. Uh, yeah, Sandeep, I mean, we we are already giving you two options to choose mm. from. Uh, mm. If you are unable to make both of them, then you would have to wait till July. Um, but mm. again, those options would be similar times on a Saturday and, and on a Monday. So. If you're able to make the um, commitment for the Monday this time around, I think that's your best option. OK, then I'll go for 15, 20, uh, rather 15th. All right. Yeah. All right. Thank um, you. You're welcome, Sandeep, and all the best for your match starting soon. Uh, sure, right. Thanks. GB says, for some reason, if 
I couldn't write level two exam this time. Will we be informed for next level two exam? Uh, yes, GB. Um, I've got a mailing list of all the people who've passed level one, and I always inform all of you on that mailing list of level two courses and exams and level three courses of exams. So you will always, unless you ask me to remove you from that mailing list, you will always get that information. Uh, Laksh wants to thank us for the wonderful sessions. Um, I think hats off to Abdullah for running the lecture four and five on his own. Uh, thank you very much for that, Abdullah. And uh, good luck to everyone who is writing the exams. And uh, Siddharth asks, for umpiring in SA20, must we have CSA level three or experience with level three? Uh, so Siddharth, um, SA20 that has gone by this year in January, Abdullah was involved uh, because he was rated number 11 in the country. Uh, only the top 11 umpires in South Africa uh, plus Murray Rasmus, who is on the ICC elite panel of umpires that made 12 umpires were selected for the SA20 and they all have level four, not just level three. Level four is not open to the public. Level four is um, umpires who have been identified by Cricket South Africa to uh, umpire first class cricket and professional matches in the country, um, they are invited to write level four by Cricket South Africa. Uh, it is not a course that is offered by us and also it is not an exam that anybody can ask to do. So unfortunately, Siddharth, if you are not South African, um, there is very little chance that you will be able to umpire in the SA20. Uh, maybe in future there will be international umpires umpiring in the SA20 as you have international umpires umpiring in the uh, Indian Premier League. Uh, but of course those are elite panel umpires that are umpiring in the IPL. So um, at this point in time, Siddharth, I would say get as much experience as you can in your home country, get to your highest level that you can in your home country. And if you become an international umpire, then maybe you can come over and be invited by Cricket South Africa to umpire in the SA20. Uh, but of course, we as Western Province Cricket Umpires Association have an exchange program for club umpires. Um, we have recently had Daytrim Singh, who is going to be writing level two with us remotely. Uh, he did level one with us last year, October, and then in November, he came to South Africa for three months and he was able to umpire club cricket in uh, Cape Town. So that is an option available to uh, umpires at this level. We've got level one, level two or level three. Uh, professional matches will only really be for professional umpires to umpire in. Dr. Saint uh, says for those using Android phone, I hope it won't be a problem for us to switch to our cam scanner to scan our answer scripts since we are using the same Android phone for the exam. Uh, Dr. Saint, um, good question. Uh, if maybe you've got two phones, you can use one to scan uh, while you remain on your um, on the Microsoft Teams call. We need to watch you at all times. So um, use your phone to be on Microsoft Teams and then use uh, a family member's phone or anyone who lives with you or if you're going to be at uh, work or school than anybody. Um, obviously, you're not going to get help from that person, but you're just going to use their phone to scan because we need to be able to watch you at all times. I hope that um, 
explains that. Uh, Ashley asks, are there special courses for umpiring disabled games? Uh, very good question, Ashley. Um, we are in the process of developing a course to umpire blind cricket. Uh, blind cricket is a lot more complicated than um, let's call it normal cricket as we see it on TV and as we currently umpire it because blind cricket uses a ball with bells in it and there are all sorts of different rules and regulations around blind cricket. Um, myself nor Abdullah have not umpired blind cricket matches, uh, but we do have in our training department at Western Province Cricket Umpires Association Verlin Etzebeth, who is an accredited trainer, who is busy putting together a training course for umpiring blind cricket. Uh, I imagine it is going to be more a practical course than a theoretical course. So uh, we will attempt to record it when it does happen. We're aiming for it to be in January 2024 and then we can post the recording on our YouTube channel. Uh, Siddharth just wants to give his thanks to us for the sessions. Siddharth, you're very welcome and hope to see you for level three. And then Sandeep has a question related to IPL playing conditions involving DRS and third umpire duties. Sandeep, uh, Abdullah is our DRS specialist, so please unmute your microphone okay. and you can go ahead. No doubt about it, for sure. Um, question is, the ball has been bowled. Uh, On-field umpire uh, gave wide ball. There was no appeal by the bowling side. And batter, uh, sorry, that was not given a wide ball. Sorry, not given a wide ball. And now, batter has challenged that decision and on-field umpire has referred to the third umpire for the um, decision of being a wide or no wide. While third umpire goes through the process, he saw there is a nick while ball passing uh, to the batter and it got an edge but no one appeal, remember. Does third umpire has a, a, a protocol to let on-field umpire know about the nick, what he has heard or seen on the snickometer? And can the batter given out without an appeal? Abdullah? Um, oh. We give that one to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this. So this protocol is new, and it's only applicable mm. to the to the yes. RPL. Our IPL, yes. Yeah. So without having read um, mm. read okay. the um, the full playing condition, I'm not able to answer. I, I I'm not able okay. to give you an answer without reading. Okay. Uh, if this is allowed as per the IPL playing conditions covering um, the DRS protocols. But but yeah, I, I, I don't know. Um, um, what was the question, Tom? Sandeep. Sandeep. Yeah. Yeah, 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 Sandeep. Um, yeah. I don't know. But, mm -hmm. but can I ask a related question? Sorry, Abdullah and Tom. So the playing conditions are for an umpire. No decision can be given out without an appeal. Right. So, so, so does that mean that in this case that Sandeep asked a question, there was no appeal. So there is no reason for a third umpire to give, uh, give that out and only look at just whether it was a wide or not a wide. And in this case, um, the, the batsman nicked the ball. So it's obviously not a wide. There's no appeal. So the third umpire would just say, okay, this is not a wide play, um, play on. Yeah, the um, yeah the law states that without an appeal, a striker or batter cannot be be given out. 
So, so I'm not sure how the 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 playing conditions in cover because there's been a challenge by the batter. So, yes, I'm not sure if the PC covers because of the challenge. The batter now opens himself or herself up for being dismissed. It could be a possibility that because of the challenge, if there was no no challenge, no appeal, mm. it would have just gone mm. on like normal. But because of the challenge, maybe the batter now um, opens himself up, even though there's been no appeal. But because you've now challenged it, you've now uh, opened that door for you now to be given out. Okay. That's, it. It. that's, that's the only thing I can think of. Okay. Yeah, Lux, just remember that um, playing conditions overrule the law. So... Again, we, we don't know the playing conditions for challenging of wide decisions in the IPL. It's something new, as Abdullah has said. Um, so maybe there is that clause that if a wide is challenged, then the option for the batter to be out exists even without an appeal. Uh, we don't know. Um, but what I can say is that would be mm. a very stupid batter to challenge the wide appeal when he's <laughs> next to the ball. <laughs> but, so, but Sandeep, there are many. I don't, I don't think it would happen. <laughs> no, but there are many instances when even batter does not know that he nicked mm. the ball. Yeah, that's it's true. a very feather feather that's touched. True. Yeah, so you know because in the interest of getting a wide, uh, maybe batter call it as uh, challenge it rather, and then third umpire noticed that instead giving a wide he, he nicked it on the snickometer. Yeah. Actually, in the Appendix D of, uh, you know, playing condition 3.3.4 section there, which which actually talks about, but it's actually contraving the the other section of the playing condition. So I was I was just thinking that, you know, maybe if if uh, either of you are aware about the uh, the IPL PC, because reading through it, it's difficult to to make a decision whether the third umpire can disclose or cannot disclose. Um, that's why I asked this question. Okay. Sandeep, have you got the playing conditions for the IPL? I do have it. I do have okay. the copy of it. If you can yeah, send and... them, if you can send okay. them to myself and Abdullah, that would be great. We can have a look at it and then maybe email you our thoughts. Absolutely. I will do that right away. Awesome. Thank you very much, ladies and gents. That's all the questions in the chat box. Uh, a few more thanks. And I, I really want to thank all of you for your interaction. It's been very interactive, especially today. I do see hands up in the meeting room. Uh, Taiwo, uh, if you do have a question, and if that's not an old hand, please unmute your microphone and uh, ask your question or comment. Uh, the hand has gone down, so I assume that was an old hand. And then we've got another hand up, GB6153. If you, that's not an old hand, you can unmute and ask your question or give us your comment. Uh, hand down as well. So I think it's safe to say that everybody has had and said everything they wanted to say. Um, so I'll take this opportunity to thank all of you for your interaction and participation over the last six weeks. And I want to wish you all the best for your exams. I've gone through the payment protocols. I've gone through the exam protocols. I hope you're all ready, all excited. And we shall see you online for the writing of the exam remotely or we shall see you online for our first level three lecture uh, and the date of which will be confirmed in the middle of May. Um, in fact, next week, Thursday, I should be able to confirm the lecture dates and the exam dates for level three. Thank you all very much once again and uh, Enjoy the rest of your weekends. All the best for your exams. And yes, Laksh, on Thursday, the 11th of May, uh, once the amount of candidates for level two exams have been confirmed, I will email the level three dates 
for courses and exams. OK, thank you very much once again. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Good day thank you both of further you. and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you both of you. Appreciate it. Cheers, Cheers everyone. Welcome. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye-bye.